Hi, my name is Blair Palazzi, and I founded and run an organization called 350.org. And I'm here today with these wonderful people with great privilege to spend some, a day with you talking about something I think I care a great deal about, but I think all of us do, which is what we value the most and what we depend on the most, which in many ways is the environment that we live in and with every day. So I just wanted to say, uh, join uh, everyone today and traditional owners in particular for their wisdom and their connection to that because often we become so disconnected from that that it's very difficult for us to stop and really see the big picture of the impacts we have. So I hope that I can bring a little bit of that perspective through my eyes of a climate change campaigner. Yeah, okay, sure. Uh, it's live. Uh, I just wanted to use the number 350 in defense of the atmosphere. So 350 is an odd name for an organization. Why did we pick it? Uh, way back when the UN was holding its Copenhagen, one of its earlier climate change meetings, um, the idea of forming an organization that put that number all over iconic places around the world, including the Great Barrier Reef underwater, uh, was to get people to say, what's 350? Uh, and to have a point of reference that 350 is the safe level of CO2 we can have in the atmosphere. Now we're well above 400 parts per million. At the time, we were about 380. But the idea was to get people to ask and understand that climate change isn't a problem that might happen one day in the future. Climate change is something we're already living with, and we were living with back in 2009 before that Copenhagen meeting. So that's why the number 350 and why the name of the organization. And I think the bigger question for us is who cares? Why should we care about climate? Why should we care about this big issue that we often feel we don't have any way to have a control or an impact on or a positive way to find a solution? So the first question is the atmosphere. We don't think about it a lot. We breathe every day. We live in the atmosphere. It's a very delicate thing. It's a, it's a, it, while it covers a great deal of space, it's that 16 kilometers between us and when it starts to kind of meld into space that we're all dependent on every day. It's a balance. The gases in it are very finely tuned to allow us and all the life on Earth to exist. It protects us from the sun, uh, the damaging rays that would come through and kill us if it wasn't there to screen that out. And it keeps the earth warm, just at the right kind of temperature that we can all live in. And unfortunately now, after 150 years of, dare I say it, using the atmosphere literally as our pollution tip, we have wrecked it. We have turned the temperature up on earth to a point when we have to question whether it can sustain us and for how long. So the impacts we already know we're seeing, and I think First Nations people are often the ones to talk most directly about seeing the changes in their land because they're connected to that land. Farmers as well, fishermen, those people that live and are really actively involved in the land. But we're already seeing one degree of change to our atmosphere, and we can see what that's already done to the world. Extreme weather, we're feeling that Typhoons and cyclones are of a, of a level that we've never seen before. They're happening more quickly, more uh, close to each other, year upon year. Those, ex those ideas of storms that happen once every 100 years are now suddenly happening every five years, every eight years, every 10 years. We're seeing drought. Uh, here in Queensland, it's a huge problem. But we're seeing it all over the world, Africa, North America, uh, parts of Europe, middle, middle par countries, you know, parts of, of the world most dependent on that really delicate balance and the need for water are suffering. We're seeing fire and bushfires of a kind that we've not seen before in intensity and coming earlier and staying later. We're seeing sea level rise and the change and shift of disease, things like malaria as bugs, mosquitoes, etc., begin to move based on temperature change. We're seeing coral bleaching. I know everyone in Queensland can't think about what's happened to the reef without probably, you know, their stomach clenching, a tear in the eye. Seventy percent of the reef in the northern parts of the Great Barrier Reef have been impacted by bleaching. And we know it's because of temperature rise, and we don't know if it's going to recover, or if, or how, or when. And finally, we've seen impacts on agriculture and fishing, our very food and what keeps us alive. So all of these things together really are the question we're here, all of us today, to look at, which is, you know, we're dependent on these things for our lives. What are we doing with it? And why is our legal system and our political system not supporting an effort to protect that because we all depend on it? 
I won't go through all of these numbers, but I think it's important just for a minute to realize that since Paris, which was the UN's attempt to get the world to agree that we had to reduce climate change, we have to stop the warming of the earth, and more importantly, not to think about two degrees, because we've already seen what one can do, but to drop that down to 1.5 degrees. So it's only 0.5 of a degree from where we are right now. So I just want to point out that number of 353 because it's a newish number. It's a number that says, what does 1.5 degrees look like if we're going to stop emissions at a safe level? And in particular, a report that came out just a couple weeks ago said the first thing is we simply can't build any more coal mines, we can't produce any new oil exploration, and we can't be you know, dropping more gas mines anywhere in the world. But here in Australia, we are still acting as if it's business as usual. And from an economic point of view, off we go. So I just finished this slide to say we have only one choice to make if we want a livable planet. And that's to stop what we're doing, to wind back what we already have, and to refresh our atmosphere and come to a place where we can find that stable number and that stable place. Our challenges are big. We don't have a federal government with any idea how it will deliver on its Paris commitments. We've signed that treaty along with the rest of the world. But we don't have a plan and we don't have leadership. We have limited state leadership, sometimes shining through, often in a state of chaos and often disconnected from other states around. So that there's not a unified federal plan and there's not a plan between states in order to deliver. We have the double challenge of a domestic energy uh, system that's largely based on fossil fuel, one of the highest per capita emissions in the world per person. And we also have the terrifying problem of the idea that our economy is hooked to our exports of coal, oil, and gas. The problem with that is it's not even calculated in our Paris figures. So we think we can just keep pumping out coal, oil, and gas, shipping it out, making money, uh, not realizing that the impact that we're having is on our very own atmosphere as well as that of the rest of the world. Our legal system doesn't value the atmosphere, it doesn't value the climate, and that's where this perspective of putting nature at the center has to come into play. So I'll just finish up for what will it take? It's going to take a lot. It's going to take days like this where we come out with a really strong uh, question and challenge to our existing system to say it's not doing what we have to do. You really have to wonder about a political and a legal system that doesn't value the very thing we all depend on to live. So I hope this tribunal will hear that message and that we can come away with some really good ideas about what to do next. question and just to reiterate uh, and to ensure that everyone and perhaps folks who've come a little later to understand the, the possibilities and expectations around this people space, we won't be able to take away the comments and the great ideas and do anything on our own. What we're interested in is creating this space so that everyone can talk together, find this extra space and a new voice to add to the many voices to keep pushing. So I'll actually put the question back to you, Blair, because I know 350.org has been absolutely instrumental in things like the divestment campaign and other <coughs> activism. I'd love to hear from you about where can we find encouragement that civil society is stepping in and doing great things when our governments at the moment are failing us? Because this humble little people's tribunal is the beginning of a space to talk together and to make things happen. But we are not in any capacity to walk away from here telling others what to do. We're reflecting what everyone else is telling us. So I would love for you to share some optimism about what is it that's working at the moment? What are you guys up to? What's going on? Yeah, I think the building of that movement and that all of us in the room have every responsibility to carry forward that political and that activism pressure that's going to be needed here in Australia to bring about a change. I think we wouldn't have seen an outcome in Paris, and you know, I'd be the first to say it's not, it's not going to be the answer. The decisions made at Paris are a great step and incredibly difficult to get the world's head around to agree. But it's not going to be enough, which means that we've all got to keep the pressure on to push further. And to do that here in Australia, we first 
got to figure out how we deliver on what we've already agreed. So I point to the election coming up in Queensland as a perfect example. Get active, make phone calls, write emails, ask questions about how your elected officials are gonna deliver and how they're gonna help us as a country make that transition because it will happen and it is already happening around the world and here in Australia we're pretending it's not. So using your activism as a divestment tool, taking your money out of fossil fuels, putting it into alternatives that are better for the planet, getting active in an election, getting active in your community, making sure people around you are educated. Uh, there's loads we can all do and I think that it starts with conversations and it, more importantly working together to find what works in your community. So hopefully all of us can take that away. And just one other thing, I, I think the Paris uh, Agreement, um, exciting because the world's agreed to something. Uh, there's a meeting coming up in November, the country getting the most questions asked of it about how's that idea coming about how you're gonna deliver is Australia. The number one country in the world getting the most questions about how are we gonna deliver is our very own country because we've shown absolutely no planning and no strategy for how we're gonna do that. So I think with that movement behind us, and pressure from international countries. Dare I say it, the word uh, economic sanctions come, starts kind of floating that around at the UN. And I think you'll see people in the government beginning to think about it differently. If we're not going to be a global player and do our bit as a developed country to contribute positively, pressure will come. Thank you, thank you. Um, a question here, yep. Um, uh, could Mary? I just ask, um, well, again, make, sort of make a comment. I've heard, um, you know, a whole lot of things being spoken about climate change for ages, and a lot of it, quite rightly, is to do with, um, un, you know, terrible situations where, like the in, say, islands or something, the water coming up, and they're going to have to move the refuge, you know, climate change refugees, almost like that. Um, and also, of course, the damage, terrible damage to environments everywhere. But um, I, I don't, I, and, and of course the. All the scientific stuff is always there, very critical, you know, and it's informative and so on. But nobody actually talks about, uh, unlike what Indigenous people have always done, is that they're very good predictors of things, over thousands of years, I mean, to prepare themselves. Does anybody um, in the, like, technological kind of area warn people that what will happen if you have to do without? Do you know what I mean? No more, you know, phones, no more of this technology. Because where does all that come from? It come, you know, the old saying about um, people, people make technology and after a while, technology starts to make people. Do you know what I mean? It makes people. So you gotta, you know, say that uh, as a factor of climate change, you know, all very modern, um, mainly Western countries, you're gonna have to do without. Basically. I don't think we'll have to do it out all together, but balance is going to be critical. You know, and knowing the limits of our systems and learning to live within that is absolutely, you know, it's got to happen here, it's got to happen everywhere in the world. Literally, not just sort of saying it, like that, spelling it out exactly how it is, you, you won't be able to go and f buy anything you want. You know, because certain, uh, I don't know what that element is, but it needs to be in phones, I think. I, I forget what it is, but certain elements, minerals, I mean. Are required, but nobody ever talks about those things. Right? I mean, scientists and you know, technological people. I'd actually like to, uh, Brendan. Do you want to? Yeah, I mean, I, yeah. you know, this is a good point that we. we uh, I, I think this is a very important comment that a lot of the problems, we're, environmental problems, we're talking yeah. about, uh, are the result of our lifestyles. Mm. And 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 it, it, you're, what you're asking us is, is to what extent changing our lifestyles. Well, some of us changing our lifestyles, you know, it has to be part of the solution. And I think a good example of that is international aviation. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, it, it, it's called a bunker because it's aviation emissions uh, are not accounted for by any country. Right? No one's responsible for them. Uh, and, and there's no way to offset them once you burn fossil fuel in the atmosphere. It's, it's affecting the system for thousands of years. So what's the future for international aviation? Uh, for like, you know, tourism, like, I fly a lot for my work, you know, do I, do I as an academic have to stop, you know, going to international conferences as part of the solution? I think these are really important questions that you're raising. I would certainly like to make a comment, given I endured many years doing a PhD on consumption, and 
It certainly is the mindset of the Western liberal mind that the world is limitless and limitless growth is a huge issue and the whole concept of Earth jurisprudence is white fellas talking back to themselves going, well, hang on, we lost our way a little while ago and now we have to think about how do we reconnect with Earth, but more importantly, how do we tell ourselves that we can't be spoiled kids anymore burning everything up. We actually have to listen to Earth, understand, set limits on ourselves. And I actually think this, as you're right, I think adaptation is a little bit of a word that people throw around preparing, but it's just preparing infrastructure for sea level rise. Our culture doesn't want to hear that things have got to change. And I can say as a white chick, I know most white people who are rich or comfortable, they don't want to face this. They don't want to see what's going to happen. So we're, we're a society that is not prepared legally to take on the challenge and we are not prepared culturally or emotionally for giving up a lot of the stuff that we don't need. And I don't mean to be harsh about that, I'm just as guilty as anyone else, but I do think it's one of the critical issues and most of the white fellows in Australia are some of the richest, most affluent people on the planet, even humble working poor like me who don't make much of anything. These are things we have to confront. Having said that, I'm not a luddite. I'm not. I like my phone, and, but I, 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 I don't have an iPhone. I, I like the dumb phone. <laughs> Thank you so much, Blair. Thank you. Thank you.